that uh, that quickly, huh? Just going right in, right in on it, right in on 2023. Stop petting yourself. I'm, j- I'm just moving my hand to a comfortable resting position. You don't need to go in on me like that. Like 2023. Listen, just I don't have anything great to say about 2023. We are we are um, 14 hours and 57 minutes into 2023, and decidedly feels exactly the same. Um, and I feel really sad for anyone that's like 2023 is going to be my year. No, well, no, it's no. just the same as every other year. Now that might just be my nihilistic side, but uh, look, I say it's 2023, new year, new you. For watching this podcast episode, you get to be a new identity. Oh. Yeah. Can I identify as a beholder? I like the stalks. The eye stalks. Well, we've randomized them, so. I don't get to pick my stalks? Nope. Got to roll on tape for it. That's highly unfortunate. Well, uh, I'm Connor. And I'm Sam. And we are the Dungeon Bros, but we are not brothers. Nor are we in a dungeon. Yeah, so. We're just, we're just... We're gonna review 2022, and uh, the the sad part is is I wanna I wanna talk about the good things in D and D because there were good things sure in D and D, um just comparatively comparatively, which is the coast is not having a great year. No, no, uh, uh, yeah, we might wanna some some might call it shitting the bed. Ooh, shitting directly into the bed. Yeah, yeah, like, um. Like Amber Heard levels of bed shitting, specifically pillow shitting, possibly mm. in that context. Mm. Yes, from Wizards of the Coast. It's been a, it's been a rough year. They have upset fans both of D and D and of Magic: The Gathering at seemingly every turn, both in decisions that they've purposefully made and decisions they've well, they've just overlooked some things. Yeah. As well, not a not a great look per se, but. Nonetheless, we're time. Time goes ever on, it as, does. as it as they say. So, uh, Sam, how how are the holidays for you? How, how are you uh, doing? You know, well, let's just say today's uh today's episode of the podcast is sponsored by me getting food poisoning the other day, so I didn't get plastered last night. Mm. Mm-hmm. And also, mm-hmm. you had to work this morning, so yes. You so I also plastered. did not. Well, I had some I had some lovely beers with the family. As on December thirty first, I had my Christmas because uh, my beloved father. Decided to abandon us for the holidays, <laughs> which can't really blame him. It's going to be what? fucking freezing here. <laughs> like, like Florida, right? Yeah, Florida, Florida. Florida. They were they were enjoying a frigid 60 degrees Fahrenheit while we were dealing with like negative 10 actual. Ah, uh, yes. The, so how did they ever survive? I know. How did they? Ever I, I don't know how they survived. Apparently it was like a there was like a tuna sandwich. It was like fourteen dollars or something ridiculous. Wow. Like that. So why are they a, buying tuna sandwiches? That's a well, that's a Seinfeld reference. They oh, actually got like missed that one. Mm. They got they got like a Cuban sandwich, a salad, and another salad and a couple of drinks, and it was like one hundred and twenty six dollars. <laughs> mm. And when I say a couple of drinks, I literally mean like two, like two to four. Yeah beverages and it was 126 dollars because high-end resorts yeah that happens yeah well fuck them for not inviting me anyway so uh before before we get into the regular business uh if you know us you probably know us from tiktok yeah where we've inexplicably not been posting at all (laughs) the holidays are hard guys holidays are hard we 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 took a planned leave of absence from the internet, he says in retrospect, after just not posting a lot because he's tired. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we, we made a post before recording this live. Plan on recording stuff probably tomorrow because we need to. Yeah. And, you know, we'll hit we'll hit 2023 strong because, you know, new year <laughs> going to be better than the last one. New year. New you. We yeah. lost your old identity in the mail. We are so sorry. Yeah. 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 But as usual. Uh, but if you want to, you can check out the link tree and all of the things. You can follow us on TikTok, where over 30,000 of you already do. In 2022, yeah. we have gone from, oh my gosh, early year celebration, we hit 10,000 followers, to now comfortably over 30,000 mm-hmm. and growing strong every day. 
if this were a linear growth, we could expect 50,000 by the end of the year. Me personally, I'm hoping the growth trend continues exponential. Maybe, yeah, maybe, you know, like 75. That'd be cool. That'd be great. That'd be cool. That'd be a good time. We would we would then become one of the larger D&D TikTokers. Yeah. That are sub 1 million. Because <laughs> yeah. basically, like, you hit 100K and then it's like, oh, oh, and and they gone. Yeah. They gone. Yeah, you're, you're either uh, you're either on the... Oh yeah, we all we all know each other by uh, you know it's us over here with RPD and RPD. and 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 uh, Big Daddy Velvet, Big Daddy Velvet, or it's like oh uh, Wizards of the Coast is inviting Jenny D to do uh, some some yeah uh, stuff for them in the middle like, of the year, and then there's like Dice Cream Sandwich, oh, yeah. <laughs> all at Quincy's Tavern, all those great people, great huge, people, huge. different echelon, yes, different echelon. I digress. You can follow us on the TikToks. You can subscribe to us on the YouTubes. We're 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 barreling, we're barreling through. We got a lot of shorts, a lot of Magic the Gathering shorts, but we're also doing like a little learn to play D&D thing with some random mechanics that Sam's doing, which mm-hmm. is nice. It's a good time. Subscribe to us there so you don't miss. We got some videos planned to come out here in yeah. the next month. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Scheduled already to upload. Not planned as in like, oh, we want to do these. They're done. They're ready to go. Be excited. Or don't. Then <laughs> you can go follow us on the Instagram. And, you know, I'm going to shout it out. You can follow us on the Twitter as well. You can't. We it exists. I'm probably going to include it in the link tree. Going to revamp the link tree here soon, just a little bit. Mostly from Twitter, I see our our dear friend Fell the Leb uh, uh, making Leb. comments. Uh, which, by the way, you can of course go watch our bonus episode of the podcast we did recently with Norb Fell the Leb, uh, YouTuber and Twitter meme tastic guy who <laughs> who's also a personal friend of mine and we did a deep dive into one D D, all the playtest material that's been out after the clerics ua which was a great time uh do all the things we're going to have our year end collection of homebrew collected into one package with a sampling of uh items from the blood magic pack on drive through rpg that uh comp- the dungeon bros compendium as i think we're going to call it We'll just be like an all-in-one package, really easy. You can find the link in the link tree. We're going to charge for that one just because I I want to just update the file every year. So that way, if you buy it once, you will get the updates every year as they roll out. That is the plan. I think that's how that will work. Hopefully. I hope that works. Fingers or else crossed. I just lied to you, which is embarrassing. And now, by the time you are listening to this podcast live on Wednesday... We have an Amazon affiliate store. Mm-hmm. It's going to be the best way to financially support us or just uh, play our TikToks on loop for like an hour. Yeah. Like just put it up, like pull it up on your iPad when you're not like you, you finished pooping. So you'd have no use for your iPad for the next eight hours. Yes, because that's the only thing people use iPads for. Yes. You, you finished your poop. You open up the TikTok app on iPad. You go to our most recent video. You hit play. And then you set the iPad down on mute. You can even plug it in. Yeah. Even plug it in. It'll still charge. Then when you return to poop the next time, you will have helped us quite a bit, and we can appreciate that. Is that all the links? I think that's all the links. Discord. Oh, the Discord server. You can join our Discord server. We had some lovely holiday celebrations. It was a good time. Gave away some stuff. Great. It was a good time. Very good. Yeah. It's a lot of promoting for ourselves at the beginning of the podcast. Yeah. Uh, but some things that you... You got to get it in early. You don't want to get it in right out of the gate, but I mean, you got you can't wait till the end. kind of went right out of the gate. It was basically right out of the gate. It's fun. It's really fun. Uh, the Cleric UA survey is going to be open until January 20th. So a little bit over a week and a half as of the posting of this. Um, of course, if you want Wizards of the Coast to listen to your opinions on 1D&D, this is the only way you can get them to actually listen. I would like actually Wizards of the Coast to put out a survey survey um, because <laughs> I took the survey. And man, let me tell you how um, comment box is great. The rest of the survey... Not very intuitive. No. It's like they just listed out everything and said satisfied or dissatisfied, extreme dissatisfied, dissatisfied, satisfied, extremely satisfied. I'm like, you asked me if the fourth level of an ability score or feat was satisfactory, I guess. Yeah. Like, that's not what I'm looking here. It would be nice if they had like a little comment box on the outside so you could be like, I'm satisfied. And then you can leave a little. That'd be exactly. That's what we need. That'd be Uh, nice. Other than that, uh, upcoming with Magic the Gathering releases, we got Dominary Remastered coming out January 13th. Uh, as uh, which and then Phyrexia all will be one which will be dropping February 10th yeah Dominary Remastered should be coming out around the time we record the next episode of the podcast in two weeks 
with all that out of the way, uh, it's rigged. The entire system's rigged. Um, I, I am convinced you are launching a campaign against me on yes. Instagram, and I would like to move a vote to cancel the DN draft. You want to cancel the DN draft? Cancel the DN draft. Start, the tw- start 2023 with right. no DN draft? Uh, we have to, by unanimous vote, uh, all in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? Well, well hold on. You didn't, you, didn't, you didn't sway me in any means? I'm trying. To, I'm trying to bum rush you just to just to get it out there, and so that you agree. I would like to filibuster. Much like, God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> much like, much like the terms of service things. That I want. I want you to just scroll through and click agree. Okay. No. All right. Well, uh, if, if you're unaware, Sam won the DN draft for the anime, which is fucking bullshit again. <laughs> Ludicrous. 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 Luda. Maybe it's something we'll bring back. Uh, you know what? We we started this with uh, the the uh, the foot the NFL draft this past or the fantasy football draft this past season. Maybe uh, we'll, 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 we'll it end it. We'll end it after the Super Bowl. There you go, and, we'll and pick then we it can back bring up. it back up next football season. Next football I think that, season. I think that's a good time. But we now have the next D and draft. The D and draft. For those of you that don't know, we roll on a D twenty table to get a topic, and then we have to draft five items from the topic. Everyone's doing it on TikTok. It's not that original, but it's kind of D&D themed, sort of, maybe. There's um, some D&D stuff in there, and it's a D20 table. Yeah, and some non-D&D stuff. So let's go 12. 12? That's that, a 19. That's a 19? Wow, that font is bad. <laughs> All right. Uh, bar drinks. Ooh. Bar drinks. We roll initiative for see, to see who has the first overall pick. Six. Two. Okay. That dice has rolled two like four times in a row. I think it's not properly weighted. I, the oversized dice are not properly weighted. Crazy. Isn't that wild? That's we'll go on a rant about over about dice weighting at some other point in time, but right now we're doing bar drinks. Bar drinks. Um now are we delineating a couple ground rules? Yes. Cocktails only, or are we including cocktails and draft beer? Um and if we include draft beer, are we going to delineate different types of beers? Or are we going to do like general categories of beers? Like the IPA versus the domestic light beer versus the, you know, the I, I think I think uh, we should go with anything that we ourselves or our friends might order at the bar um, without being specific down to name, mm. but it does. But if you want to do draft beer, you'd have to be like, I want to do a draft IPA or a okay. bottled lager or something bottled like lager. that. Okay. Now, would that be difficult in the cocktails as they have specific names? I think cocktails being the fact that they do have specific names, uh, like when you order, let's say, a, a cause I already know my first couple picks. I, I already know my first ones uh, but uh, so my first one since I'll go first will be the old fashioned the old fashioned when you order one. an old fashioned and you're not in Wisconsin you you expect a certain drink to come yes you expect a certain flavor like not even necessarily fl- flavor specifically flavor profile I would say when it comes to like draft beer like a draft IPA versus a bottled uh, IPA you do expect yes. two different t- tastes there. yes yes okay so the old fashioned the old fashioned tell me about it what do you love about the old fashioned? Um, I am a. We are both big whiskey fans, uh, bourbon specifically. Uh, my first, my first beverage is also a whiskey drink. There you go. Um, but yes, bourbon specifically, and uh, uh, you know, it's just one of those. Uh, it's it's simple, but it's it's classic, and uh, I've drank far too many of those mm-hmm. on some very good nights. It is very easy to get sloshed on the old fashioned. Mm-hmm. If you like, if you like, if you enjoy a whiskey and you're a thirsty, thirsty boy like myself, it's very easy to just pound a couple of those and be gone in an hour. It's great, yeah. love it. Now, another thing I enjoy to pound at the bar: beverages, mm-hmm. not beverages. people. No, ne- you never, should be waiting until you get people. home to pound. Never, never people, never people, never people. The whiskey sour. The whiskey. Sour. The whiskey sour. There's two main varieties of the whiskey sour. There's the cheap, common whiskey sour, and there's the proper, nice whiskey sour. I would argue both of them are adequate mm. in many ways. The well whiskey with the sweet and sour sauce, if you will, <laughs> which in many ways it is. It, yeah, it's a syrup. Over ice. Mm-hmm. A, a perfectly adequate beverage for very easy to order, perfectly good anywhere at any bar. It'll be fine. You know what you get. Yeah. Now, the proper whiskey sour of the whiskey with the citrus juice with, hear me out, the egg white. Mm-hmm. Shaken in a shaker, get nice and creamy and frothy. 
marvelous, spectacular, stupefying, if you will. Indeed. I feel like I lost a lot of people with the egg white. That may not have been a good first overall draft pick, but that's fine. I, I, no, it depends on how uh, how hoity-toity our crowd is. I don't know. Yeah, that is true. That is true. All Same right. Number um, two. Number two. Uh, ooh, geez. I think this is not a personal choice, but this is a uh, very, uh, very uh, uh, high-level choice. Mm. And I think we're going to have to go with the... Um, classic martini ah the martini yes. interesting interesting shaken or stirred uh since we're going classic it would be stirred if you're doing a vespers then it'd be shaken vespers, and of course this is a little bit denoted to one of my favorite quotes of all time which i believe came from winston churchill he said i would like a dry martini and uh i would like in the way he likes it is uh you make you you uh put the you stir the gin with ice while you can see a bottle of dry vermouth Mm-hmm. Uh, he would drink chilled gin, effectively. Mm-hmm. Yes. Now, do you want a nice clean martini, or do you want like a dirty little slutty martini? I, I don't like olives, so yeah. I'm going to go with, with a with a regular. I feel like I went a little bit too specific. Maybe maybe threw some people off with the egg white cocktail to begin with. So mm-hmm. I want to go. I want to. I want to take it back a little bit. The classic. Every aunt loves them. Every every college frat guy that doesn't know what to get at a bar just does it because they sound classy. The gin and tonic. Mm, a G the and gin, T. The G and T. A classic, very herbaceous, mm-hmm. non-offensive. If you have a fine well whiskey, it's gonna or a well gin. If you have a if you have fine well beverages, yes, they'll be fine. Yes, they'll be fine. Very safe option. The lime can cover it all up. The tonic tones things down. It. All good. Helps keep away malaria and scurvy. We have both gone whiskey, then gin drinks. Yes. Sam, what is your third overall pick? I'm going to go into the beer category, as we were mentioning earlier. Already going into the beer. Yes. I'm not planning on going to the beer Uh, Well, I am a big beer proponent, Um, and I order a lot of IPAs on draft. Mm -hmm. So that's when mine is draft IPA. Draft IPAs. (laughs) Yes. The IPA. The IPA beer, mm-hmm. if you will. I, I know a lot of people uh, are against it, <laughs> you in particular. Yes, I am not a fan of the IPA. Not a fan, um, but I at one point sat down and was like, I'm going to learn to like these, because I was working in a brewery at a time, and um, less so now, but there was a the, the IPA, hu- the huge IPA wave, like the crest the of big, it. The big push. Was a few years ago while I was working at a yeah. brewery. Um, and I was like, I have to be able to talk about these mm-hmm. for my job. Mm-hmm. Uh, I like things to taste good when I drink them. Thus, I do not like IPAs. Uh, Number three overall for me. Ooh, I'm torn. Going with the head here. Head? Head sense? Very popular amongst the basic white bitches, if you will. And very popular amongst anyone at... Any sort of Mexican mm. restaurant, the margarita, the margarita, the margarita, the the bottomless margs, the 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 table apparatus that is a large tube of frozen tequila slush with a little spigot on it. Yeah, you put into a large chilled glass. I have gotten very sloshed off of the <laughs> endless martinis before. <laughs> <laughs> Such that I have had to have the assistance of those around me to finish my large mark. A classic. It, it, the pairing at the Mexican restaurant sure. is just With next the, level. The chips and guac and salsa and tacos give and me, give, give me all the beans. Give me the rice. All that, yeah, very... The uh, vaginas with the margarita. I hope I pissed people off with that. Was how you said fajitas? Yep. Took me a second. <laughs> Two, <laughs> don't worry. The vaginas. Very good. Samuel, fourth overall pick. Fourth overall pick. Um, I had a I had a good one, and um, I lost it when we were talking about margaritas. Yeah. The, I, the, that's what happens when you're drinking them, man. You just yeah. You, you just, just start, you start losing thoughts. <laughs> Um. Oh, I know what it was. I was going. To, I, I've I've decided to change gears and go towards the ever popular brunch drink, uh, the mimosa. The mimosa, mimosa. is. A classic. Another bottomless uh, alcohol mm-hmm. option um, or pitchers of such. Um, our, uh, myself and our buddy Darren have sat many a morning long 
Uh, mm-hmm. Not in not in the several mm-hmm. years though, mm-hmm. due to you know the end of the world. Just sipping away on mo- on mimosas until it is well past the hour, which they will allow us to continue to order them. The mimosa, as a, as a young drinker in my twenty uh, ones. <laughs> in my 21s the mimosa always seemed like a really like a really frilly like oh i need to be i need to be going to the brunch with the gals in my later years the mimosa is just a lovely beverage indeed it's just a lovely just beverage. a lovely beverage now the the impetus for my love of the mimosa came from christmas time when my brother would uh insist that we enjoy uh the gin and orange juice mm, with the gin and juice with the christmas breakfast which Evolved into various other alcohols in orange juice. Just whatever you can mix with orange juice at that point. And when I first had a proper mimosa, it changed my life. It changed my life. There you go. I also want to bring up, this is not my pick. It's okay. not my pick. I, Honorable not mention? My, not my pick. <laughs> Decidedly not my pick. And something I bet you find disgusting. If you're a frat boy, the bromosa. Are you familiar with the bromosa? Not from no. You take a, a, a lovely orange juice, a Tropicana. You pour this into a glass along with your light beer. Oh, the, sure. The uh, Miller Light, the the Natty Light, the PBR, just whatever whatever a, you got. Beer Mosa. Whatever you got, liner the Bro Mosa. Mm. A classic, a classic. Highly recommend. Uh, Have not had it since I was in college. <laughs> I mean, I, at, at places I've worked, um, either uh, champagne was you know not something you wanted to pop every day because it kind of goes bad as soon as you pop it. Pop, pop. Or we didn't carry it because we were a brewery. Uh, we would do either cider mimosas using a, li- a dry lime cider mm-hmm. or um, a lily cap- uh, a passion fruit white ale mimosa as well. Mm. Lovely, lovely. We spent way too much time on the mimosa. Anyway, fourth overall for you. So the mimosa, in alcohol percentage, you can down those things all the live long day. Oh, you and could. And you can get sloshed, but it's going to take a little while. The bubbles also don't help. Oh, yeah. Bubbles make it burpy. The, arguably the most efficient alcohol to bloodstream method behind the butt chug, of course. <laughs> <laughs> behind the butt chug is the Long Island iced tea. The Long Island iced tea. Okay, yeah. Or... Any of the other varieties on the Long Island iced tea, there are various other types yes. with different mix-ins, but it always is a base of basically a pint glass of the core alcoholic spirits yep. in a glass together. It's a lot. <laughs> uh, there's a lovely there's a lovely bar, uh, bar grill, sports bar in the area that used to have like 30 different varieties of the Long Island iced tea. It's a lot. I think they chilled out on that, and there's now just like a small curated selection because that's more fiscally responsible. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's I. Uh, one of my my favorite bar in college uh, would do Long Island. I want to say it was Long Island Tuesdays, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and so on Tuesdays, it was Thursdays for the thing. I'm yeah, yeah, but uh, yeah, you would go. You get a Long Island for like two bucks. Yep. Yep. And. Um, yeah, my my college crew would roll up on a Tuesday because mm-hmm. we're all like, we don't have anything to do on Wednesday until like noon. Oh yeah, that's always a good time. The midweek, the midweek binge drinking. Sorry, the midweek regular drinking in large quantities. Yes, drink responsibly. Sam, your final pick, fifth and final pick. My fifth and final pick. Uh, and and we often talk about the heart sense versus head sense, and here. This is something I've ordered at a bar quite often, mm. uh, but it is my heart sense because not a lot of people often go with this unless you're at a specific establishment for it, and that is going to be just the whiskey neat. The neat whiskey. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Now, are you trying? Are you are you trying to play the game here of like, oh, there's some people that just want the neat, like, well, you're not going well whiskey. No, no, no. With the neat pour. No, there's uh, one of our mm. one of the, the bar that mm-hmm. I go to most often. Uh, has has you know the the normal selection of mid range and low end whiskeys, but then they have two shelves with uh, with some nicer whiskeys. And usually, when I see in one that I haven't had yet, uh, because you know buying whole bottles is kind of expensive, I'll just order a single pour. Um, but I don't want to be drinking that all night, so I'll just order a single pour of something nicer, mm-hmm. and that'll be the way I usually end my night. End your night with, end the, my with night. the neat mid to high shelf whiskey. Exactly. Interesting. I feel the need to go for value here. Go for it. And 
there's going to be many people that don't agree with me, think that this shouldn't be on the list. Mm, I would argue this is what keeps most bars afloat. Mm, interesting. I In have thought of what it is, but I'm excited to hear what you think. The draft domestic light beer. Yes. The is. Miller Light, the Bud Light, the Coors Light, the Michelob Ultra. See, my guess was either going to be the, the draft version or the bottle version. Because there are a lot of proponents a lot, of the bottle version. A lot, a lot, but I'm going with the draft because the draft experience is just better. That's fair. The draft experience for every, any and every beer, better than the bottle. Much like the soda, the draft soda mm. is the superior soda above both the can and the bottle, glass or plastic. It's true. All forms. All forms. Now, is there something, is there like some kinesthetic thing about the glass bottle with a beer or glass bottle soda? Absolutely. Absolutely. Love, love the feel in your hand. Absolutely. A close second only to the draft variety. The Miller Lite specifically has a, has a, a soft spot in my heart. The classic dad beverage. The dad beverage. The beer, the beer my own father drank. Yes. The beer that not one eve ago I had several of. At a bar with my family, my father in particular. Mm. The, as, as much as you may not like them, there are better beers, sure. obviously. Sure. We know there are better beers. We've had the better beers. We enjoy the better beers. Mm-hmm. But is it, for example, are your draft IPAs going to be there for you when times are tough? <laughs> I, am is, I going to order a draft? Am I, am I going to blindly order a draft IPA every day? Not no. at all. No. Never. No. Never. Even even you're slightly above. Like, is, is Shock Top going to be there for you when times are tough? I don't think Shock Top is going to be there for you most of the time. Is the Blue Moon going to have your back when you're down and out? No. The Budweiser is going to be there for you. The Bud Light. The Coors Light. The Miller Light. Even... You, 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 obviously, this isn't within the same category, but you could give, you can go upscale, the 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 Coors Banquet, mm. the, the Miller High Life, the Stella, the Stella Artois, classy, and always going to have your back. So, uh, real quick, we do not advocate for drinking just because you're sad or anything like that. Not at all. Drink not responsibly. A, not at all. Don't drink because you're sad. Uh, I was about to say something worse. Um, <laughs> Sam's team. Sam's team. The Old Fashioned, the Martini, the Draft IPA, the Mimosa, and the Neat Pour of Whiskey. My team. The Whiskey Sour, the Gin and Tonic, the Margarita, the Long Island Iced Tea, and the Domestic Light Draft Beer. I, yet again, refuse to believe that I'm going to lose this. I guess we'll have to see. As of when this podcast posts, check out the Instagram and we will upload a poll to see whose team is preferred. Let's put in D&D class to replace it on the table. All how right. Does that, how does that work for you? Sure. Okay. Go for it. D&D classes. D&D classes. So we're going to talk about 2022 in a moment. Yep. As we have now entered the 2023. But we do have some things we need to talk about first. Big thing from Wizards of the Coast related to the one D and D. We talked about the hashtag Open One D and D trend, I believe, on the previous episode. Uh, people worried about the OGL and its non-existence currently in One D and D. It is playtest material. It will not exist until it is published material. Mm-hmm. That being said, people were very worried that without an OGL, they would not be able to have. They would not be able to create third-party D and D content specifically to sell. Which there are a lot of D and D homebrewers that make a very good side gig, mm-hmm. making and selling homebrew. We sell homebrew. Yes. Now, we're not making a lot of money off that no, homebrew. Not yet. No. No. Most of our content is free, and we want to keep it that way. Yeah. But there's some nicer things. You check out the link tree in the bio for their drive through RPG. But the team at Wizards of the Coast released on D and D Beyond a write up talking about the open gaming license, the system reference document, and its inclusion in 1D&D. It is a long article. They've got some points in there. What we want to point out are some things that we always kind of assumed. Yes, there is going to be a a system reference document 
And there's going to be an OGL that covers the system reference document and allows you to use aspects of it to create your own homebrew. Mm -hmm. We knew this was going to happen. If it wasn't going to happen, the fifth edition OGL would still exist and you would still be able to do things in fifth edition. And since it is backwards compatible with 1D&D, you will be able to bring it forward. They admitted, or they announced that they will release version 1.1 of the open gaming license in early 2023. So we can look forward to that at some point, I would assume, in the first quarter up until about March. We'll be keeping our eye out and check that out when it does and tell you about it. They want to make, they're they're saying they're taking their time to make sure that the OGL version 1.1 is very clear about what it covers and what it specifically does not cover. There are many aspects of the D&D books that you are not allowed to use and replicate for homebrew purposes. Mm -hmm. There are two bits of really, really three bits of information that I feel like are a little bit concerning. Mildly concerning. Mm -hmm. If you want to use the OGL to create content, you have to let them know that you are offering items for sale. You have to alert Wizards of the Coast. The means by which you do this are unknown. You have to report open gaming license related revenue annually if you make more than $50,000 in a year. Mm -hmm. Immediately, that's suspect. But you also have to remember, there's not a lot of people making more than fifty thousand dollars annually on OGL content. I would assume that'd be that's that's going to be a company that's high full time working. That's That's not that's not that's not us or any of your favorite TikTokers or even most YouTubers. Rune Rune Smith and uh, XP to level three are not netting fifty k revenue from OGL related homebrew. It gets a little. It gets a little. That another problem is it gets a little murky when they have Patreons and offer homebrew as rewards for their Patreon contributions. Yeah. Is that revenue on OGL homebrew content? Uh, we don't, don't know. You don't know. The last bit that I find the most concerning, and they note that there are fewer than twenty creators worldwide who make more than $750,000 a year in income, they're going to add a royalty to people making that much money starting in 2024. No royalties will be demanded below $750,000. But the fact that you have to report to them annually Mm -hmm. if you make more than 50K. So if you're one of the massive homebrew creators, I would assume on level of Critical Role, Darrington Press, on the level of maybe MCDM, I don't even know if he's that big. I don't know. We're talking high, high, high tier producers of D&D OGL content here. They're going to be required to pay, pay royalties, which... In a sense, I understand. These people are taking your product and making a lot of money using aspects of your product. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not like it's a brand new concept of royalties. Not at all. Uh, uh, Not at all. Movies uh, and other cinematic works have to pay royalties when they use licensed material. Absolutely. The more concerning thing for me is the reporting aspect of everything. Like they're trying to strong arm anyone who creates content with the OGL. Mm -hmm. Now, the fact that they require you to report your annual revenue to them, that is not a normal thing to do um, in the private sector. No. Not at all. And to me, it reads as... You're making a significant amount of money. Not a ton. You're not you're not getting rich from this, but you're making a very significant amount of money. This is like one year salary for a low middle class American revenue. Mm-hmm. Obviously, obviously income after taxes and after the yeah. cut from the, all that kind of stuff. If you reach that point, I see a world where Wizards of the Coast starts contacting them, trying to get them under written contracts prior to the mandatory royalties at $750,000. So taking someone the size of, I would assume, MCDM, someone the size of Rune Smith of XP to Level 3, who I would I would venture a guess 
could be netting that much in revenue every year. Mm-hmm. And going to them and being like, hey, uh, maybe maybe something like we can sweeten the pot and expand the the options you have available to you, give you an expanded system reference document, an expanded OGL, and we will take a 5% cut of any sales. This all goes back to our previous episode's discussion about how D&D is supposedly, according to Hasbro, under-monetized. Yeah. And this is clearly... For one, they're getting out in front of this. People are wondering about an OGL. They hadn't said anything. They're putting all this information out there before it comes out. Mm -hmm. But it's clear that this is... To me, I think it's clear that Hasbro is pushing Wizards of the Coast to be like, look, there's all these people making cumulatively millions and millions and millions of dollars off of our product. And we're not seeing a cent of it. Yeah. And they want in. Yeah, Hasbro uh, and Wizards of the Coast have been very interested in controlling the uh, the secondaries, um, pre- secondary creators in the in the in the Wizards of the Coast market. Um, this year, we've seen them send lots of cease and desists to MTG proxy makers. Oh. To uh, there was one very early on in the year that we talked about where they sent a cease and desist to. People trying to make an NFT system from Magic the Gathering. And I believe they also talked about, hey, don't do this. Don't try to do this for dungeons. Oh, they tried it in, in this in this post. Don't do it for, don't make NFTs for Dungeons and Dragons. Um, and then this, during the fireside chat, where they talked about ha- wanting, to, and then their investor meetings earlier this year, they've talked about wanting to increase their profits from magic the gathering and how dnd is going to be a huge you know a a a huge cash bomb for them not bomb as in a bomb as in bomb as in woo cash everywhere um (laughs) but uh nagasaki this is we don't um but yeah wizards of the coast and hasbro have been very interest very much interested in growing the amount of money they can make and this is definitely leaning hard into that, even though you'd think that, you know, there's the, these 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 reporting methods. They're self-reporting methods. Yeah. I'm curious about the policing of this policy. That's what's more concerning to me. How are they expecting to enforce people to report revenue from OGL content? Mm-hmm. Are they going to be... Because, for one... To accept the license terms, you have to let them know what you are offering for sale. Uh, how are they going to police that? Right. Are they are they going to be, have hire lawyers that scour Drive Through RPG for content that wasn't submitted to them, mm-hmm. and then try and strong arm these websites into giving them sales data on these products? And if they're making a certain amount fine you sue you cease and desist you like they're as you as you mentioned they're already more than willing to send cease and desists to big fans of their products that are making wonderful supplementary material to help people that enjoy their products Mm -hmm. it seems to me they're trying to wring more money out of the people that want to help them the most rather than Letting them help them. Yeah. Letting the creators help them. Supporting Magic the Gathering creators that may criticize them. Notably, one of the, the biggest Magic the Gathering YouTube channel, I think maybe outside of um, the Command Zone, is Telerian Community College. And Wizards of the Coast have never partnered with him to do anything. No. Because he's critical of a lot of their products. Oh, yeah. I... <laughs> It seems like it, it. Sometimes it seems like Wizards of the Coast only ever partners with like Critical Role or Dimension Twenty or people who are really big and don't really give comment about what they think about the systems. Yeah, they just the book releases. They're just happy. They they they, they just want to go with content producers that don't really talk about the content itself necessarily. Yeah. It's. This is a new wrinkle. I mean, obviously, we knew there was going to be an OGL. I thought. I, I thought from the beginning that all of this, they're not going to have an OGL, we're not going to have homebrew, was uh, 
making a mountain out of a molehill. Mm -hmm. But this molehill has got a lot of deep, dark tunnels in it right now. Yeah, this is more like an ant hill. Yeah, ant hill at this point. This, this mole, this mole, left months ago. Oh yeah, ants taken over. Colony yeah. massive. But to, to continue this metaphor, <laughs> I, we're looking at it right now. We're going, all right, all right. This is we see the problem. We're thinking about this problem, and then we're gonna turn around and start walking. We're just gonna fall into a pit hole. You know, uh, just uh, yeah. our foot's gonna go deep into the earth. Yep. Um, yeah. here in probably one I'm those, guessing one of those ant tunnels that yeah. was barely holding up the weight of the dirt itself and the moment something stepped on top of it is like collapse yep i bet that i bet we'll see something here in about i'd, I'd, I'd give them a good four to six months before we see them uh really stick their their foot in their mouths again with something like this yeah once they release the actual ogl there's people are going to be scouring it and that's a good thing the very good thing very good thing hold companies accountable we love dungeons and dragons Mm -hmm. We love a lot of the people that work at Wizards of the Coast. We love the creators and designers. We do not love Wizards of the Coast. <laughs> we do not love Hasbro. We do not love Hasbro. These are organizations, corporations. Hold them accountable. Yep. So, the other the other only major news of the week, Samuel. Uh, yes. Uh, Wizards of the Coast announces a formality legality shift uh, to pre-release with Phyrexia All Will We Won. Basically, up to this point... Um, when Wizards releases a set, uh, you they do a pre-release and that, and then a week later they do the full release. And basically for that week, the cards that are available that people get during the pre-release are not standard legal until they get released the next weekend. So now, as of Phyrexia, all will be one, which will be released in February. Uh, pre-release cards will be standard legal as of the pre-release honestly something that I'm surprised has not already happened and something that really doesn't affect much of anyone in my mind it affects I'm I'm sure there are some people who it affects more greatly than casual players like us but Even, how many how many Magic the Gathering tournaments are happening in the week between a pre-release and a full release of a set I don't know That'd be some great data, data analytics to have with this, Wizards. But a good change nonetheless. Uh, uh, the philosophy of you've got the cards in your hand, you can play with the cards. Yeah. Big fan. Love a pre-release kit. Love a pre-release. We're, we're big fans of the pre-release kits. The promo cards, wonderful. Always a fun time. Six packs, a die, promo card. It's a nice little package. I like it for the arena code cards for Magic the Gathering arenas that give you six packs on arenas as well. I know you're a big fan of the the Magic the Gathering arenas. I'm slowly working arenas. my way through all of all of the sets on Magic the Gathering arenas by buying pre-release kits off of eBay. That is the Midnight Hunt, Innistrad Midnight Hunt pre-release kit that I got yesterday. Yesterday. It was a wonderful time. And we have some videos on pre-release kits. You can check out our unboxing of the two Brothers War pre-release kits, uh, as well as some pack openings from one of them as well on the YouTube right now right now i think 40 people have watched it <laughs> go check it out <laughs> go check it out and finally finally uh the wrap up critical role announces a new board game that lets players duel as vox machina characters uh such neat Very such neat. neat yeah um darrington press has announced a new board game um till the last gasp uh such a bad name <laughs> such a bad bad name it's a storytelling board game that will enable players to embody different types of characters from across many genre genres as they duel to the death in a cinematic showdown um yeah this is going to be it's it's a uh it's going to have a lot of different features of um, not being well, not, well, not only being able to play the Vox Machina characters, but also as uh, your own custom characters, and they state that you'll be able to reenact other scenarios such as lightsaber battles and uh, Harry Potter esque wand duels. Um, I like I like through a, this mechanic. I like a two player competitive game, one on one. You don't need a big group to play. Who the fuck named this product? I don't know. <laughs> Till the Last Grasp requires yes. you to think. Sorry. Till the Last Gasp requires you to think 
about what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> even if even shorthand, last gasp. You want to play some last gasp? I can't say that as a person with the lisp. <laughs> My point exactly. <laughs> also, rude to people with lisps. Uh, the people that named the lisp the lisp. Right. Rude. <laughs> Very rude. Also, till the last gasp. A little bit of a, a little bit, a little bit innu- innuendo. Yeah, there's, there's, it, I'm not saying it's sexual. But I'm not not saying I'm not not saying it's sexual either. What I am saying is that it's a bad name. <laughs> um, of course, as any with anything, as soon as it's announced, there is some concern because uh, if you pre-order through one of the through the Darrington Press Guild, which is a series of stores that, like any uh, any big company, have a deal with Darrington Press, uh, you can get some of the Legend of Vox Machina uh, uh, special specialty characters. Yes, they do. There is a concern that there are only 78 stores that are part of the Darrington Press Guild and that none of them are outside the United States. Uh, a lot of fans um, who like Legends Vox Machina won't be able to get their hands on any of these special character sheets, uh, and especially international fans won't be able to. Um, people are hoping that they will release them online or in the future. Yeah. Good, good for them. I believe. <laughs> I, I, I strongly believe that there is somebody who's going to order it, take a picture, and put it online. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I. Sh- <laughs> yes. This is. This is the story I don't, of a girl. I don't know what it is about the Critical Role fandom that just loves to make big, massive stinks about innocuous stuff. You know. Maybe they're not legally allowed to sell it out of the United States. There are a lot of legality things. There, there's a lot of difficulties with. with that stuff. You know, there's a re- there's a reason that the shop.critroll.com is where things go first, and then they have to later bring it to the other stores the because UK there's store and the because there's a lot of red tape. Yeah, top A, as some people call it. And for a product that, if we're being honest with ourselves, is not going to sell nearly as many copies as something like Ukatoa. As something as like most of the shirts they sell, like I think it's fine, especially when on the day of release you'll be able to find probably very high quality scans of it of anything you want anywhere online. Should we take some high quality scans of our stuff and put it online oh. for people? What do we have that people want that they can't get? Um, your face. Where's the bean? Where's the cat? I don't know. Yeah. She's cat. Like, normally she bothers us when we do this or she'll sit and be very cute in the cat bed. I'm kind of concerned. You should be. Well, anyway, let's review Dungeons and Dragons as it was in the year 2022. A lot of good things happened in 2022. A lot of uh, wizards also. A lot of wizards the coach shoot himself in the foot happened in 2022. The, the 2022 is the year of cool shit happening in spite of mass ineptitude mm-hmm. you know i don't want to talk about i don't want to talk all negative because it's not all negative but if we, we're just going to go down the line we, we've got a little document here with all of the meat sam put together of all the meats sections of the podcast from episode five which was the first one of 2022 mm-hmm. feel free to call out whatever you want i want to start with the legends of vox, vox machina yes the legend of Vox Machina. No. If you will. I won't. Season two coming out very soon. Yes. Season one, I think, much better than a lot of people were anticipating. Uh, popular amongst Critical Role fans, popular amongst D&D fans, popular amongst people not fans or know anything about any of those properties. Yeah, I've had uh, a lot of people I talked to, this was their first introduction. Um, and when, and, and you know, Critical Role didn't hold back by showing you scaling balls within the first, like, five minutes. With moments. 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 Mere moments. Gnomish, gnomish testicles. Moving on, uh, in episode six, we got the re- we got the announcement of the release of Spelljammer. Or, yes. Yes, Spelljammer, Adventures in Space. A, that, was, that was when we were really excited. There was, a lot of, there was a lot of good vibes going around. A lot of good about vibes. About the Spelljammers, and... Things just kind of fizzled out later. That was that was a, one of the first signs of something's up, something's wrong here, mm-hmm. something's not quite right. 
Yeah, uh, Wizards made this whole big. They made this whole mysterious entrance with uh, the re the the reintroduction of Spelljammer since it hadn't mm. been uh, available for you know in five E yet. And we were all like, "Is this is this happening? Is this really happening?" And, and it, teasing it on Twitter and in ads. And it took several uh, several weeks before they finally uh, came out and said, "Yes, Spelljammer is happening this year." And not only was it happening this year, it was going to be three books. It was going to be a box set. It was going to have a DM screen. It was going to have all of these things. It seemed like it was going to have this big push. And then when push came to shove and they release it, a little, little, bit, little bit racist, a little bit racist in the Hadozi. Yep. And uh, then the moment that that happened, there was no marketing. There was no push. We got it like the week it released on Amazon for like 30 bucks. Yeah. That's three books. For 30 bucks, you can get not even all of the already released D&D books, let alone the three book box set of Spelljammers. Now, are the books much smaller than a regular book release? They're on the size of like the Sword Coast Adventure Guide. Or the, yeah. Yes, Sword Coast Adventure Guide. Sword Coast right. Adventure Guide. Yeah, that's what's called. Not on the size of like a Strixhaven or any of the Critical Role books or anything like that. Or even like standard rule books. A tumultuous time. Most of the content in the books is fun, but they had all these plans and they had all this excitement and then just the rug got pulled out and then product died on the vine. Yeah, pretty <laughs> much. Ways. It's a damn shame. Later, we got Call of the Netherdeep, though. Yes. My, if... Obviously, we can talk favorites at the end if you want, but I want to say, top my tier. my favorite book release of the year, yeah, is Call of the Nether Deep. You've gone by far. You we, you started. We, well, we were getting ready. You were getting ready, and we did some lead up sessions to get ready to run it, and that campaign just kind of well. Well, it's it's not it's not a way. I've got plans. We're gonna it's it's coming back. You can it's reform it later, but schedule scheduling. And because we only did the Wild Mount pre adventure, you can simply take your characters. And then we can start Call of the Nether Deep. It's true. As intended. Call of the Nether Deep is a great adventure book. If you are a fan of Critical Role, it takes you across Jorhas in Wildmount. It takes you across the seas to Marquette. You, it, it's rich in lore. It's very well written. It's very detailed. Very DM friendly in some respects. Not very DM friendly in other respects. A wonderful adventure book that pairs well with all of the other Critical Role book offerings mm -hmm. as a product. My favorite product of the year. You've gone, you've gone through that thing multiple times. You've put so much. You've put a lot of prep into that. Yes, I will be running that campaign, regardless <laughs> of scheduling conflicts. Uh, during this time, they also announced the release of Morden Kanan's uh, Monsters of the Multiverse, mm -hmm. which replaced Volo's Guide to Monsters and Morden Kanan's uh, Tome of Foes with all of the updated character races not outside of the PHB, as well as all of the updated monster stat blocks that included new formatting and ways of uh, that they are going to continue on doing those things for uh, the foreseeable 5e future, and I believe... 1 D&D as well. Yeah. Along with, of course, a smattering of new options as well. Morden Cannon's Monsters of the Multiverse was another weird release that it came out months before that. Before it, before you could buy it on its own, it came yes, out. Yes, it came out in a, in in a, a bundle. box. Yeah, in a bon um, bundle with Tasha's. Tasha's, Xanathar's, Tasha's. and the player's handbook, I think. Maybe. And yeah, you couldn't buy it for like three months. Uh, you couldn't buy it solo for another three months. Yeah, it it a weird decision for them to make. In in many ways, I get it. Mm -hmm. It's like w here's the box set of everything you could possibly want: player's handbook, Xanathar's, Tasha's, and Monsters of the Multiverse, which covered the Monster Manual and Volo's Guide to Monsters, and well, not the Monster Manual entirely. There were some things. Anyway, it, it, the Monster Book, the Mon yes, and. As a reference book, it is very good. Mm -hmm. The new formatting for stat blocks, you, I, you could take it or leave it. It's personal preference. That's how they're choosing to do it. I don't think that big of a deal. The way they released it was just a little bit weird. The product is perfectly fine. It's it's innocuous. Yeah. It's also... It's, it's, it's nice to have everything in one place. 
It is also strange that it is, I think, the first release uh, that um, nullifies, inactivates, whatever, uh, 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 sweeps under the rug two other previous releases. Because mm-hmm. um, Volos and the old, the old Morden Canons, the Tome of Foes, are no longer available for purchase, uh, and I believe they're also offline. They've been taken to off D and D Beyond as well. Really, I believe it's their defunct or whatever. Not, into, I can't remember about that entirely, but I believe that was the plan. Well, let's check. We have let's this technology check. right now. Sources: Future Adventures, source books, Monster Manual. There. Morning Canon presents Monsters of the Multiverse is the one that's available. Yeah, so you can no longer get Volos or, Mar- or Tome of Foes on D&D Beyond, which of course is Wizards' official site now. Interesting. That is an interesting decision. Well, let's see. Volos Guide to Monsters. Book, it contains legacy content, which means doesn't reflect the latest lore, blah, 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 blah. Fascinating. Can I just look at it now? Nope. Still... Purchase Monsters of the Multiverse. So if you buy Monsters of the Multiverse, you get the legacy content of the other books, Hmm. it seems. That's interesting. Which is... To me, it's just weird that they would do this update most of the way through the life cycle of 5th edition Mm -hmm. when they're prepping for 1D&D. An odd decision, but a perfectly fine product. Moving on, we got the inklings. We got inklings of a new D&D starter set that ended up revealing itself to be... The Dragons of Stormwreck Isle. Yes. A self contained uh, adventure starter set for uh, Dungeons and Dragons 5th Edition, a campaign that I am playing through right now in my work game. Uh, we're doing a lot of side missions right now, which is, you know, it is what it is. Mm-hmm. Scheduling is a whole thing. Sure. But we will be doing Dragons of Stormwreck Isle. It seems perfectly fine as of the time that, that I am recording this. And from what we have heard from people that have played through it, it is a wonderful adventure. A lot of exciting things. Ship combat, dragons. It, wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. Let's see. That also, well, with the release of that, I don't know. At the point where we're, where we're looking at this, we don't have dates. Um, yeah. But with the release of that, that did uh, they did put... Lost Minds of Phandelver, mm-hmm. the former starter set or former former starter adventure, up on D and D Beyond for free. Yeah, it was a nice a nice little gesture. Mm-hmm. There. We had a D and D musical coming out. I think it's out. Uh, yeah, it's, it's out by it's, now. Its run is done. Yeah, it 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 it, it, it ran. Uh, as as earlier mentioned, Wizards was stopping people from making NFT content on Magic the Gathering cards. So. More inklings of Wizards of the Coast being weird. This was also around the time that um, we saw an investor group come into Hasbro and try to spin off Wizards of the Coast from the main company. Yeah. Oh my gosh, that's right. Altafox. Ah, the Altafox saga. That was a, that was a wonderful saga of the podcast. We had we had several episodes of new updates and. Obviously, the activist investor group that only had like nine percent holding in Hasbro wasn't going to get Wizards of the oh, Coast spun off. That it was like two percent. I thought was it? It was. Know. It was really low. I don't know, but it was an interesting thought experiment. I think to would Wizards of the Coast be better off without Hasbro? And seeing how things have played out the rest of this year, I am more in agreement that Wizards of the Coast being spun off. And not having to prop up the company of Hasbro and not has, having Hasbro breathing down their necks to say, monetize D&D more, print more Magic the Gathering sets. Like, they just backed off a little bit. The products would be better. People would be happier. It would grow over the long term. They're looking for short-term gains right now, which they're getting. Yeah. But it's not going to last into 2023, and it's certainly not going to last beyond that if they keep this up. Uh, that was that was a fascinating saga. Yeah, that was just the beginning of it. That was a several month long. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Uh, we had we had new Magic the Gathering sets. Mm-hmm. Kamigawa Neon Dynasties, a very popular one. Yes, I the Streets good. of New Capenna. Less popular, but still good. Had uh, some good cards. The Dominaria United. Now the Brothers War. Some other sets in there. You know. <laughs> the Magic of the, the 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 was Forgotten Realms this year. Uh, no, Baldur's Gate. Baldur's Gate. Commander Legend, year. Baldur's Gate. Yes. Which would also mean that the two Innistrad sets, Crimson Vow and uh, Double Double Feature was, was, in, was this year. Was this year, which <sighs> was a bad set. 
bad set. It was just the two sets combined in grayscale. Not great. Yeah. Uh, Moving new... back to D and D. Yes. Uh, Journey through the Radiant Citadels came out. Oh my gosh! Uh, this uh, the anthology book mm-hmm. um, for this year, which was written uh, uh, major uh, in- entirely by PO3 creators, asked to bring their culture into a D and D set or into a mass D and D setting. Yeah, I love I love the adventure anthologies quite a bit. Having nice little self contained things that you can pluck and play. Uh, the Radiant Citadel itself as a setting is like a, here's a nexus point that you can jump off and go do all this crazy shit. A great, a great setting for people who maybe have a lot of friends that want to play D&D. And it's like every week someone else is going to run a game. And it's like, all right, I'm going to run for, I'm going to run a game for three weeks and we've got this set of five people. And then next month, this guy's going to run and it's going to be like some same people, but some different. And it's like, but we all want to kind of play the same characters and the same campaign. We had, we had the thought for this early on when we moved into this place of getting people in, but not having to commit to long campaigns, Uh, jump in, jump out, do different adventures, different people DMing a great setting. A very good book release in my mind. Yeah, I, uh, I, of all the of all the book releases, I think I heard the most positive about that one. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, we also had D and D being released in Portuguese. Yeah, uh, they made a stride this year, of course, to get new players, um, and that was by doing it in different languages. Mm-hmm. And Portuguese was one of them because apparently there's a pretty big um, scene in Brazil. I think. Mm-hmm. I mean, I I wouldn't be that surprised. There's a lot of Brazil, to be fair. Oh yeah. And the announcement of the Dungeons and Dragons Onslaught. Yes. The war game for Dungeons and Dragons, a miniatures based war game, kind of, but it's really more of a board game than a war game in many ways. Yeah, we got to, uh, or you got to play test it at, or learn it at um, Gen Con this yes, year. Yes, they gave us a uh, pre release kit. Uh, we both tried to get in, or preview kit, sorry. And, uh, we both tried to walk on, walk on because the tickets were very much sold out mm-hmm. by the time we wanted to get in on it. Uh, I managed to get in. Sam did not. And I played uh, two games while I was there uh, with Wizards of the Coast staff there that were helping us uh, with the rules and how to play and answering all sorts of questions. And we got to keep our preview kits for ourselves. Uh, it included four mini- or six miniatures, uh, mm. four playable characters, two goblin miniatures for uh, NPC enemies. And it's uh, it, it's interesting. Obviously, the preview environment was a very limited version of what will yes. be eventually available. But in many ways, it's like, well, there's going to be new scenarios that you can play through. and But the core game is going to be two heroes played by one person and two heroes played by another person. And you can win by defeating a lot of NPCs and completing mission objectives or defeating the other player. And therein, I think, lies the problem. Yeah. That it is, in my mind, going to be a lot easier to just fight and kill the other player, especially if that player's game plan is to try and complete the scenario mission. Yeah. If one person commits to the scenario mission and the other person commits to killing the other player, the player who committed to the scenario mission at the beginning is going to be fighting NPCs earlier, and that is going to be basically a death sentence especially in a one-on-one game Mm -hmm. so i'm a bit more skeptical now that i've had time to think about it and marinate on it but it was a fun game i want to give it a try when it comes out at the very least yeah good time and we played we played our own little game of it we did at at the at the airbnb i did not roll well no no you did not but uh that one was supposed to be released the initial game was supposed to be released in october this year i believe and got pushed back till or october of 2022 got pushed back until february of this year i believe yes so it'll be coming out in the very near future Mm -hmm. um they do have they also announced plans to continue to put out um seasonal almost releases kind of like a battle pass style yeah where uh they're going to add a booster box a booster box more factions more and uh, more minis more scenarios and keep that up uh, uh, for local and tournament play. Yes, and I think I think now is as good a time as any to talk about the Gen Con. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Our, fir- our first foray into Gen Con, the best four days in gaming, as they say. They do. We got into the Magic: The Gathering there. We play tested several wonderful games. 
we 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 did a wonderful ship combat game armada that we finally painted the minis on and have yet to play because <laughs> the map is too big to fit on this table. Yeah. Oh, it, Armada's a great game. It was a lot it was of fun. very fun. And we and played just a miniature version of it. A very a very small beginner learn to play. Like if you were play if Armada were a video game, it was the tutorial. Yeah, we played the tutorial. And it was very fun. A lot of fun games to be played. Um got to see a lot of other TikTok creators there. Uh, met up with Norb and some other creators, hung out with some friends, made some new friends. Yeah. It was it was a wonderful experience. We got recognized. <gasps> we did. That was unfucking believable. <laughs> I, I we were pumped. I was pumped to talk about it when it happened, and I'm still pumped that it happened. Cause, uh, literally, not even like 15, 20 minutes before that. Yeah, I was saying, how funny would it be if someone were like, "Are you guys the Dungeon Bros?" That would be the coolest. That con made if that were to happen. And at that point, we were just like walking around, and we eventually went to some. I think we we're heading towards a panel. Some panel to like listen about. So I don't even remember what because I was just so high on it at the moment. I'm sure it was a wonderful panel. And we were walking by and there's just this wonderful woman who was sitting on the ground. She's like, you guys are the Dungeon Bros? And I stopped in a, and I like had that moment of, did I hear that right? <laughs> Am I thinking this? I turned around and she was staring at us and she was like, oh my gosh. And then got a wonderful interaction. Loved it. Yes. Took a picture. It's on Instagram. Love it. <laughs> Big fan. <laughs> Moving on to actual news again. d d Honor Among Thieves. Yes, the movie was announced. Great. Going to be coming out soon. Can't wait for that. It's supposed to be at the beginning of March. Now it's at the end of March. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, classic D&D game. <laughs> classic D&D game. Uh, I suppose a Dark Sun tease that really hasn't materialized into anything. Yeah, we haven't seen too much of that. Um... Oh yes, uh, later that this year or during 2022, uh, going back a little to Morgan Caden's multi- Monsters of the Multiverse, D and D Adventures League accepted that <sighs> as one of their source books you could choose. Yes, when which, creating character, which I I really think they should expand the PHB plus one rule of Adventures League in general. Um, I. If you want, if you want a monstrous rate, if you want to be an ASMR, you can't be a hexblade warlock because that would require two books. Yeah, a, I, I certain books I feel like you should just have access to. PHB, I think it really should be PHB plus Monsters of the Multiverse plus Xanathar's Tasha's plus campaign setting and just that. So you get access to the core rule supplements, Morna Kanan's Monsters of the Multiverse, Xanathar's Guide to Everything, Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. And then the plus is we're we're doing a Dragonlance campaign, we're doing a Spelljammer campaign, and then you get access to those books. I think it would just be a lot simpler. And in some settings, that's not entirely necessary. Sure. But would that would that make character creation a lot more complicated? Adventures League is streamlined, yes. It's clearly a lot to iron out, but nice thing that they accept. I'm I'm gonna jump down here a little bit. Uh, man, the controversy of the summer for the for the uh, TTRPG slash nerd community in general, um, the the Phoenix Stone controversy. Oh my gosh, yes. So it uh, came to light through a series of tweets. Um, how, uh, uh, um. Demonstrative? Is that the right word? I think I probably. How monstrous? How about monstrous? We're in sure. D. Um, Satine Phoenix and Jameson Stone were when it came to their employees, their coworkers, and their uh, and other hired people that they worked with in the past several years. Um, basically, uh, a tattoo artist came on Twitter and shared a bunch of the messages between them. Um, and then from there, people came forward from, you know, everything from streams that uh, Satine was on and helped run to uh, Satine Quest, mm-hmm. um, which was the cruise that she and Jameson put on um, for uh, uh, nerd culture. Mm-hmm. That, uh, that was weird. Yeah. Like, rule of thumb, don't be an asshole. Don't be an asshole. Don't be an asshole. 
Coming from King Asshole here. Don't be an asshole. Asshole on the castle. There you go. <laughs> uh, we got the Vecna dossier. A, a wonderful collection of lore and stat blocks and fun things uh, in, to coincide with Stranger Things and Vecna being the main villain of season four of Stranger Things. Uh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> I already announced Onslaught expansions, as, yeah. we, as we mentioned earlier. Uh, um, <laughs> I, lo- I, I remember the, the FBI ruining a D&D group because they were searching for someone... Yeah, they and were... then it turned out to be like not anyone in the group. That's funny. They were like, "We we think one of you is a serial killer," and they grilled this entire group of D and D players, and it like tore their friendship apart. This this is for, this is previous. This isn't from twenty twenty two. No, this, this is this is like in the eighties yeah. or something. It, that was wild, absolutely wild. Uh, this year, also Baldur's Gate got its final beta, but Baldur's Gate three got mm-hmm. its final beta. Yeah, still not out. Still not out. <laughs> still not out. Uh, they, we're just scrolling down. Lord of the Rings Fifth Edition, compatible, third party supplement. Still waiting on that. Mm-hmm. Love it. Want more of it? They want to do more Magic the Gathering, Wizards of the Coast cross or uh, Magic the Gathering and D and D crossover stuff. Yes, because the the that, the D and D sets were very popular. D and D sets were popular. Uh, the Magic the Gathering D and D books not as popular. We did an entire episode reviewing Strixhaven. I thought it was perfectly fine. So I think part of it is because I was listening to the Command Zone. And I also listened to Tolarian Community College, both great uh, Magic the Gathering channels. If you want that in your life, yeah, they need our help. <laughs> oh, the cat has joined us. Hello. But uh, the they were talking about again. We're relatively new to Magic the Gathering, especially in the community. Um, hi, cat. Uh, <laughs> but. With with the D and D sets, there's a very big emphasis on oh, this is D the D and D set for Magic the Gathering. With the books, with the Magic or with the D and D Magic the Gathering books, Strixhaven, Theros, um, um, oh, there was another one, I don't remember. Exactly, yeah. they're not well advertised that they're Magic the Gathering settings. Yeah, the Theros the Theros book I think is wonderful. It created a system for piety, uh, very heavy God influence. The Strixhaven book though not as advertised it's a campaign book not a setting book the campaign is wonderful like a little hogwarts like wizard school thing Mm -hmm. a great time but very distinctly not but not what they said it was yeah (laughs) D &D announced a yawning portal board game wonderful and oh my gosh the big the big the big one the wizards presents over the summer we did a live stream on that on youtube which was interesting but they announced so many new products including a dragon lance yes which from what i've heard pretty good oh pretty good yeah no no one's ranting and raving about it i'm not hearing really anything bad about it which at this point i mean i'll fucking take it (laughs) you know uh, a lot of other they announced a lot of Magic the Gathering things. Uh, Drids turned thirty seven or thirty five, and a lot of they did a lot of new printings and art for Drids uh, of all the books. And um, around this time <sighs> is when Spelljammers actually dropped, and that's when the Hadozi. And yeah, we got it. Happened. We had a big. We had um, we had the Hadozi. Uh, what is the what is the correct term for that? The Hadozi. Yeah. Lineage. Yeah, it, the, well, well, it's it's the, the kerfuffle. The, the kerfuffle. I was. I, I, I thought you were talking about the the whole race versus. No, no, no. Just the, uh, the just, new one D and D stuff. Just the the spell jammers uh, failure, and mm-hmm. um, we actually. I'm going to skip a little bit ahead in my mind here. Uh, Wizards of the Coast relator uh, released an update only a few months ago about how that happened. About the fact that they that some things just slip through the cracks. It's like, basically, from what I heard, from they didn't explicitly say this, but it's basically implying a writer wrote it, an editor glanced through it, said that's fine, and it went to print. There are no spelling errors. No spelling errors. Good, print it. As opposed to like, maybe someone else takes a writing pass at it, and maybe the editor edits it <laughs> yeah and they uh they said they're going to put a, a bigger emphasis in going forward on um on not only the content 
the the verbal content or the verbiage content but the content of the words next to the content of the pictures and they're going to give that all to the cultural consultants sure and then we got the announcement during the wizards presents and then almost immediately after the first play test for the one D&D. one D D, the last edition of dungeons and dragons until they want to sell more things yeah uh we originally got character creation stuff uh races backgrounds we got some insight we we were theorizing uh based on some of the design for other uas in earlier in the year that they were going to make feats more easily accessible put feats in backgrounds which they have Mm -hmm. Uh, and then later we got the experts release uh talking about the rogue the ranger and the bard uh, a class group. There are groups of classes now designated uh, with similar feature sets somewhat. Uh, basically a theme, a thematic element to them. And we have since gotten the cleric specifically in the priest's group class. Not the entirety of the priest's group no. class, but the cleric as well. Uh, at this point, a four-player party can have four different classes yeah all one D D, and you can play one D D with a group of four right now yeah uh, a lot of rules that have changed i like some of the rule changes don't like some of the rule changes some of the rule changes seem like change for change's sake generally i think the, the classes and subclasses that have been presented are good yes i know a lot of people and and as it is in the nerd community um anytime there's any sort of change um <laughs> yeah uh there's going to be upheaval um but just because you don't like something doesn't mean that it's ruined doesn't mean that it's terrible if you do think it's ruined or terrible wizards is giving you the opportunity in the uh in the surveys that they're putting out to go say something um after every play test they have a survey about a week later that is open for about two weeks where you can write in and tell them and they have said, they came out in a video and said, hey, here, here's some of the stats. Here's what we're looking at. Um, and they have said, yeah, we're trying some things we don't expect to work. And that's okay. And that's okay. They just want the feedback they at want this the point. Because they, they might try something that they think won't work and people like it. Yeah. So, there you go. Ooh. They, they also released uh, survey results from the cla- the character creation yes. the first play test and uh like 90% approval was the feats in the background <laughs> so yep yay getting that love it to wrap things up honor among thieves delayed we talked about that it happens the great blunder of magic the gathering with the magic 30th anniversary yeah. release the ah oh! That was so dumb. That was so dumb. I don't know how they didn't see that that was going to be stupid. And then I love the fact that Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh looked at it and went, we're going to flex on them. We, they dunked on them with their anniversary oh releases this year. Like, reasonably priced. Re, like, we're reprinting the, uh, packs from this classic set that are now going to be legal modern. Well, the equivalent of modern <laughs> for their formats. Yes. And like, here's a here's the Yu-Gi-Oh, I think what was it, fifteenth or twenty fifth, twenty fifth, twenty fifth anniversary thing or fifty? Is it, it's twenty five years old. I think so. Damn, old. we are old. Damn, we are old. Came out in the nineties, and <laughs> <laughs> it's like a bunch of old classic packs, like Legend of Blue Eyes. And these awesome, the the Egyptian God card promos that people loved, and it's thirty five, forty bucks. And you get like six packs and these awesome promo cards. And it's like a celebration that anybody can get. Yeah. What it is not is four packs of proxy cards. That random you, proxy cards. Random proxy cards that you cannot play with uh, in any legal format for $1,000. That they also didn't sell out of, I would be what can't, can't confirm. They don't have their sale. They they don't have their. Uh, they don't. They don't. They never announced whether they sold out. When, they just ended the sale. When they ended the sale, there were like four listings on eBay. Period, four listings with like nobody buying them. Not a popular product. And if we're being completely honest with ourselves, Dominary Remastered that is about to come out 
is going to effectively be the actual 30th anniversary. It's a reprinting the, of cards from the, their past 30 years of Magic, often ones that haven't been reprinted or are only getting their about second reprinting. Yeah, so it's going to bring a lot of old cards into the modern era, a big celebration that could have been, what could have been for Magic 30th? Uh, other things that ha- uh, we're getting real close to our current date and time as we go. Um, we had the the rumors um, about one D and D the open one D the oh. open OGL one D and D trend. Uh, people not being able to create homebrew content. The fear that people wouldn't be able to create homebrew content with one D and D, which there will be an OGL as we talked mm-hmm. earlier. Not all good. Also, Hasbro sells off its uh, indie indie film studio uh, branch, E1. Right before they release D&D Honor Among Thieves and right after they announced that they're going to be doing other projects. I mm-hmm. don't know why. That It's not too expensive. <laughs> <laughs> uh, ugh. Bank of America and Magic the Gathering, their analysis of the business of Magic the Gathering for Wizards of the Coast, not good. Which led to the fireside chat. Yes. I will still, <laughs> for those of you who are unaware, a fireside chat was first like popularized by Franklin Delano Roosevelt uh, during World War II just to talk to the American people on their level about what was going on in the government. And the fireside chat that, that Hasbro and Wizards of the Coast did, Chris Cox and Debbie something, I don't even care to learn her name, um, the president of, of Wizards, was basically an investors meeting, which they spent the first about half of it telling people what they do uh what you know what D yeah. and magic are and then the next half of it telling us how they're going to continue to monetize D and magic. everything's fine everything's good we're we're printing to say it like we're print on demand basically like we're not over printing things i'm sure you do not have warehouses full of excess product that can't sell what we're saying is you're releasing too many product yeah. lines. You're completely missing the point and you're basically lying to your investors so that they don't all sell. Because their stock took a big hit Dude. after that Bank of America analysis. Uh, also around that time, the cease and desist to Card Conjurer, the proxy creator, uh, the proxy website that you can use to create Magic the Gathering proxies, mm-hmm. coinciding with Incidentally, the release of the official Magic the Gathering 30th anniversary proxies for $1,000. <sighs> and we now get to the present. There's a lot of good that happened. There's a lot of exciting things going forward. I personally am very excited for 1 D&D. Yeah. I want to do a playtest game. I, I think that would be a fun time. A playtest one-shot. One of us can run it, get get uh, our friend Norb fell the lab, our friend Darren, get some other, maybe maybe do a virtual game in the Discord server, which you can join in the link tree in the bio. Free to everyone. Free to everyone. Get some content creator friends in, like, hey, let's run a, a virtual one shot of 1D&D stuff. That would be a great time. Mm-hmm. And we have one, we have a, we, it's set to come out in 2024, so we have an entire another year of, of play, play tests, tests of, of UAs to come out. Um, plenty to look forward plenty to. Plenty to look forward to. Plenty to look forward to. But a, I, even more to be worried about if this trend continues for them. We love D and D. D and D loves us. D moderately enjoys our presence, <laughs> at the very least. People like us on TikTok, apparently. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Over thirty thousand of you do, which is pretty neat. Leave that one. All that be. Jester? Yeah. Yeah, I'm talking to you. Don't do that. No, no, you 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 immediately went back to doing the thing. No, you do you're doing it you're doing it even worse now. You're doing you're being She's even, like there's a ribbon. We're, we're putting that away. We're putting that away. The 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 bookmark ribbons in books, very nice. Very nice. Not cat friendly. No. With that being said, we record this live every other week on TikTok. Where you can, in the comments, tell us what you think. And we can read it live on the show. You can also put it into the podcast questions channel on the Discord server. Where nobody has done this week. I think I need to just leave. Part of the problem, I feel like, is I delete them whenever we use them. 
And so the channel is just always empty. And yeah. an, an empty an empty Discord channel is an intimidating thing to comment into. That's fair. So I might just end up leaving. Stop them. stop doing that. Probably gonna do that. But Sam, what do we got on the TikTok live? Yeah. Going to the top. Um we say we geek together says I'm an LGS owner trying to set a world record in the biggest sesh of D and D. Interested in joining? I I feel like I feel like I saw something about or something similar to this where there was this game shop that over two years was having running multiple D and D campaigns with DMs that were employees, mm-hmm. different employees at this game shop, and then over the course of two years built to this point where all of these adventuring parties. We're all battling uh, en- the same enemy on different fronts of like this massive battle. Like there was one table that was like fighting on the front lines and one table that was helping uh, hostages get out of a burning city. And there was another table that was sent to assassinate this one guy. And there was another table that was trying to steal like the Mag- like all this stuff happening at the same time and stuff that would happen at one table would then be announced to all the other tables like something exploded and then it changes the environment for the other tables. Cool. I'm into it. Yes. <laughs> DM us. It, it, follow them and okay. DM us. Also, we're in Cincinnati. So if that's far, maybe we can't. I, I, I can't do it because I'm on my profile on my phone. We'll do it. We'll see we'll, it afterwards. We'll, we'll, we'll see it. Our people will contact your people and we'll set something. We'll do it live. We'll do it. Um, <laughs> friend of the show, Typical Gemini, says, uh, when we were talking about the Phyraxia All Will Be One release. Love Typical. Uh, says, it is so good for local game stores. Hopefully it gets more people in the doors. The pre-release, the pre-release thing is massive for local game stores. And this is a big positive move. One of the rare positive moves that <laughs> Wizards of the Coast has made to help out the local game shop. Big fan. Uh, Christina Ru- uh, Rusho, uh, baller over here, asks us three questions. Uh, oh. Says, "Hi, gents. Question on building a space horror RPG and bringing in new people to RPGs. How do you maintain tension, maintain tension through the exposition moments? Trying to find music sound effects, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. For music, there's countless sound libraries out there. Mm-hmm. If you play video games." A lot of the hard work's done for you already. Maybe get an ad blocker <laughs> on YouTube if you do that route. <laughs> Spotify, there's playing playlists. Spotify, a lot um, of great playlists. I will say when it comes to, if you're if you're asking, I actually just says RPGs. Um, obviously, there are some RPGs specifically focused around horror. Um, I believe Dread. Uh, uh, Call of Cthulhu. Call of Cthulhu. Um, Ten Candles. All of these actually, a lot of these take different mechanics other than a d20 the d20 is predictable very there are 20 sides which you can get you have one in 20 chance of getting any side with these other systems they use different sorts of of randomness or chance things one Mm. uses um i believe dread uses a jenga tower Oh, so whenever oh, you try to whenever you try to make a move, you have to pull a block from the Jenga tower. When the Jenga tower falls, that is someone dying. Yeah. So it, you get to a point where you have to be like, all right, do I really want to do the thing or do and risk somebody dying, or do I just want to not do it? Yeah. Um, I know ten candles as the candle melts, mm-hmm. things happen. Uh, also, with Dungeons and Dragons, especially Fifth Edition, the system is built in a way that it is difficult to die. Mm-hmm. Especially once you get to fifth level. Oh, yeah. And once it becomes difficult for a player character to die, a lot of tension that you try to build can kind of go out the window. Because as Marisha Ray said, fuck it, we're gods now. (laughs) And if you want tension, there's some wonderful optional rules in the Dungeon Master's Guide for Gritty Realism. Uh, Changing the short rest to a day or like an evening and then long rest to like a week. Uh, adding, you can add in sanity scores and morale. Either tons of different options. Uh, exhaust at making exhaustion a more important mechanic. There's some wonderful videos on YouTube talking about gritty realism uh, from uh, Z Bashu. He does like a lot of animation content on YouTube uh, related to D and D rules and fun things. If you want to build tension in an RPG system. Call of Cthulhu, I feel like, would be a great starting point. It's very popular. There's a lot of resources available to help you out online. Mm -hmm. And as a system, 
there's a little bit of I think there's a bit more setup at the beginning than some players might be interested in, but I think it's a bit easier to run as there's not as much interaction, mm. at least mechanically, as something like D and D or some other systems would be. I will say I've been playing in a um, Kids on Bikes campaign recently, and Kids on, on the uh, the the Kids on system because they have Kids on Bikes, Kids on Broom, and then Scout's Guide to the Zombie Apocalypse. I believe is another one of theirs. Super simple setup. Um, the group I'm playing with, where yeah, we've all played D and D for a long time, but we've never played this. I think we were set up and like actually starting to do things within maybe ten minutes, um, and then we got into our first two sessions and let me tell you that system you're you're a kid yeah you're just a guy (laughs) i'm just a guy (laughs) and and as soon as you're just a guy things get a lot scarier yeah um yeah also this is a great question great question question moving on uh they also asks also have you heard of flesh and blood it's a really Mm great great tcg game that i've been playing thanks yeah we have heard of flesh and blood um haven't gotten into it yet yeah we we just learned magic the gathering (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> within the last couple months so thought about flesh and blood a little bit yeah we'll see yeah yeah we'll let it you know. seems like they like their players a lot more <laughs> uh rad shibi says hmm, what you guys talking about one D a little bit a little bit of that a little bit of this a little bit of that you know uh they say i've already started using some of the rules in the current camp camp campaign uh we've homebrewed the level one feat for quite a while yes a very very common house rule in this household to get the level one feat it's just it's quality. It's value, pure value, pure value. Especially yeah. a lot of like the more uh, character ability feats, prodigy, mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. Great time. They go on to say, "How do you guys feel about the changes to feats being spread out, uh, all spread out for all races and backgrounds? How do you guys feel about the changes for feats being spread out for all races and backgrounds? Sorry, I just didn't. I read that and didn't comprehend it. Well, they removed. It seems like they removed like the race prerequisites yes. and class. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, certain feats I think are only going to be available to certain class groups. Yeah, we've seen a lot of them in the warrior specifically. Yes, um, I'm perfectly fine with that. There were there were class or like sometimes like spell casting prerequisites and that kind of stuff or ability score prerequisites for certain feats. I'm fine with that. I think the change to putting it in the background is just a positive. Um, it, we did when we did our discussion about uh, one D and D. We we uh, had a wonderful bonus podcast with Norb and. Uh, we brought up something we had heard from uh, a fellow TikToker, uh, Dungeon Mistress Paula, mm-hmm. who was not a fan of the level one feat because that adds more complexity at character creation and will thus make it more difficult for new players to get into, which is a fair criticism. Yes. A very fair criticism. Uh, thankfully, the system and the feats that they presented as options at character creation in the first UA, a lot of them were not really powerful not broken by any means yeah useful useful but not super powerful which in that case would and obviously all of all of the the backgrounds are going to come with recommended feats for those that don't want to think about it as well which is totally fine totally valid i think it's a net positive yeah Uh, going back to dunder mistress paula's comment which um we love her. We love her. We yeah. love Dungeon Mistress Paula. And I think that while that well, it's a very it's a very valid statement. Um, the fact of the matter is D and D is not as easy, I think, to get into as a lot of people want it want to be. It, to be. Um, it is a it is a mechanics heavy system. Yeah. And taking a new player from zero to level one even it's going to be lot. could be a 45 minute process. You want to get them up to level 3 and start a game immediately. That could take it up to like an yeah. hour and a half yeah. even. Um so that being said, you front load a lot of the work. You front load a lot of the work, which I think actually is is something we've seen in the in the UAs that I hope they continue it to the books of an easier build, especially mm-hmm. when it comes to the spell casting classes of here's what you know, here's a suggested spell things you list. should take per yeah, per spell or per level of class to the spell list. Um, and I would be excited for them to also put more into the onboarding section mm-hmm. um, well, uh, or uh, into the DMG. Yeah. Part of that 
is, I think it's also clear that they're trying to push people to use D&D Beyond more mm-hmm. and making the tool set for character creation there very intuitive with just drop down menus and like it auto fills in and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and especially since the one D&D books, which exciting one D&D books are going to have codes on one on D&D Beyond. So when you buy a one D&D book, you'll have it on D&D Beyond, which will make that process even easier yeah. for many people. Which, again, a net positive. Net positive. It's the end of the line. That is the end of the line, pal. Sun's getting real low. Bucky. Bucky. I'm with you to the end of the line. I can do this all day. I can do this all day. Yeah, Yeah, I know. Yeah, we know. (laughs) We like Marvel (laughs) in this household. If you like Marvel, you can follow us on TikTok, where over 30,000 of you do. You can join our Discord server, where over almost 300 people are in the Discord server right now. Uh, we're trying to do more giveaways. We need to do some uh, Magic the Gathering spell table events with some people in the server. We need to do some D&D one-shots with people in the server as well. We do. That is one of our New Year's resolutions. Man, we, we, got, we got a whiteboard of plans. Ooh, so many plans. So much content. The, the only thing we need now... It's constant reinforcement. We, I, 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 don't, I heard a quote recently. I don't know if I agree with it, but I kind of I get where the sentiment is. You don't want to chase motivation. Motivation is fleeting. It comes, it goes. You want diligence. Hmm. We, 2023, diligence. 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 And constant reassurance from our community. Motivation with help. <laughs> In the form of likes, comments, subscribe, subscribing, subscribing, subscriptions. Ooh. Checking out our free homebrew on Drive Through RPG, as well as our compendium, the year-end compendium, which as of the recording will not be posted, but as of the posting of the podcast, will be live for four ninety nine. If you buy it once, you'll get every updated version every year thereafter. We hope. We hope that's how that works. If not, oops, sorry. <laughs> pricing pricing scheme would then change. <laughs> but you can follow us on the Instagram, the Twitter the YouTube, the TikTok, all the things. Podcast services around round, the globe. Around the globe. Apple, Google, Spotify. iHeartRadio, I think. Sure. And the Podbean. Uh, Listening to your cat purr at your, night uh, next to your ear. That your, will be an exact replica of the sound waves that we're creating mm-hmm. now, just at a different frequency. Mm-hmm. We, You can download us directly onto your... Toyota Camry's firmware. We mm-hmm. take over. We take over the entire, the entire console. Yes, and it's just us. Mm-hmm. CNS you, radio style. Yeah. You won't be able to adjust your seat position either. We are taking care of that for you. Yes, we know what's best. We do know what's best, and we're not letting you lean so far back that your hand could go like out the back window and then around no. to the front. No, that's, that's you know much. We're not. We're not trying to. We're not trying to ride low here. Okay. Especially on Toyota Camry. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> already basically grinding the asphalt at that point. Yeah. Love a Toyota Camry. I'm too tall for a Toyota Camry. <laughs> Way too big for a Toyota Camry myself. Perfectly fine for you. With all that being said, the Bean has joined us peacefully, curled up in front of us on the stream. She is V adorable. Mm-hmm. Welcome to 2023. And in the meantime.